All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the March 8th meeting of the 14 Mile Watershed Committee. Um, Barb, will we need a, um, I, I know that we have enough for a quorum. Do we need a roll call or can you uh, take um, it off I, the screen? I picked people up as they logged in. Okay, real good. Thank you for that. And can you confirm the posting, please, Barb? Yes, um, the agendas were posted on the 4th at um, the Nacusaport Edwards Bank, the Rome Town Hall, and at Pritzel's. Okay, thank you for that. Um, how about the minutes? Uh, have you all had a chance to review the minutes for February 8th? If so, could I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. Uh, sec Who seconded that? Jerry. Uh, Jerry. Thank you. Um, all in motion or all in favor? Raise your hand, please. Okay. okay. Any discussion or corrections on the minutes? No? Uh, motion carried, approved. All right. Uh, under announcements, um, I'll start with what I have here and then feel free to bring anything up that you'd like to. Of course, our, uh, our March 12th uh, local event will be this Friday. Uh, I'm hearing that the uh, sessions so far in Wisconsin Lakes Water Week have been really excellent, and I'm looking forward to joining a, a few myself, but I'm also uh, really excited about our own local event, which will be one o'clock on Friday the 12th, and uh, a number of you have been conscripted uh, to uh, take part in this, and uh, really looking forward to it, so it'll be great. It'll be our way to uh, uh, tell the world about uh, the direction of our our uh, 14 mile watershed group. Um, so uh, curious, uh, registrations, I know that we all have to register, right, Rachel? Okay, Correct. Um, so yeah, let's make sure we all do that. And um, any idea on the count yet or have you had a chance to look at all, Rachel? Uh, I have not, but I can do that right now if you'd like. Oh, uh, it's if you have a minute. Um, so uh, just, um, as a, a, a reminder for those who are involved in uh, putting on part of that session on Friday, we're gonna have a review at 3.30 on Wednesday. Uh, I think you received a week, uh, a, a weak link, the weakest link. Uh, you should have received a link for that Zoom meeting on Wednesday at 3.30, right? Everybody good with that? Okay. Um, so the other piece of really good news is um, the new website that came out last week. And I think Rachel probably has a, uh, a picture of the starter page. And um, boy, all I can say is what a wonderful job, uh, Karen, Barb, and Phil. Really, really nicely done. Uh, beautiful website. Nice job, everybody. And I know that uh, you're putting finishing touches on it, but it's uh, very nice. Would you like me to pull that up? Oh, sure, if you wouldn't mind. Don, hey. uh, I would encourage anybody who goes out and onto the website and finds errors, omissions, um, suggestions, please pass them along to Karen, Barb, or I. Okay. All right, so there it is. What do you think? Pretty nice, isn't it? So very well done. And um, I, it just represents what our direction is to be all inclusive for uh, all stakeholders in the watershed and we're including uh, a lot of our upland or upstream uh, uh, farmers and uh, as well as those of us who live on the lake. So nice job, everybody. Really appreciate it. I'll give you a hand. So, um, oh, one other thing uh, that I wanted to mention in terms of announcement, and, and then I'll open it up to anybody who's got something. Um, one of the, uh, the people uh, who's really had an interest in our 14 mile uh, committee, a uh, guy named Gus Mancuso. Some of you might know him. He was, I believe he was the principal at um, the high school in Wisconsin Rapids. And um, so he and I have been talking about something recently and he's putting something together. And um, Karen is a part of this discussion as well. 
And uh, what Gus is going to do for us is to get a meeting together with the principal of Nakusa High School with the interest that we bring uh, students and young people into the, um, uh, the Fortune Mile Committee uh, to get them involved and interested in it. And uh, for a long time, I know many of you have said we need to get young people involved. So uh, this is uh, one way we're going to do it. And it's kind of early uh, in the process now, but I just wanted to share that because it really interests me. I think uh, that's really a neat thing. So thanks, uh, Gus, for arranging that. That'd be great. Yeah. Is Gus on? Uh, I don't know. Gus, I don't know if he's uh, joined us or not. I didn't see his name right off. Okay, because then I want to say something if he's not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I don't he, see him. He, yeah, he I guess you're, you're free to go. I see two John Andreezys, but no <laughs> Gus Mancuso. <laughs> he was my, uh, he was, when I was in high school, he was my vice principal, and then, uh, then he became principal after I left, but he was also a football coach for multi generations. So uh, when I was there, he was there. My son, when he was there, uh, he was also there as a football coach. Just a hell of a nice guy. Oh, okay. uh, he's, he, has a, he still keeps in contact with those guys when he goes to different weddings and stuff and he sees them. Oh. You know, he's really, and then he went to Port Edwards for a while or something like that, but just a, yeah, a good guy. Super. So uh, it'll be okay then if we mention your name in front of him. <laughs> he probably doesn't know me. He, he you know, he, he did take me to the hospital once when I was a junior because I got my three front teeth knocked out in gym class. Oh no! But, but other than that, uh, he knows my son though, Tom. Uh -huh. I didn't play football; it's too small. But my son was all conference. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, good. It's um, um I too like Gus. I've um. <laughs> Uh, uh, gotten to know him a little bit. And um, it's, uh, you know, that's one of the things about outreach, isn't it? Is the more people we touch, the more help we get. So anyhow, I'm excited about that. Anybody have anything else in the way of announcements? Yeah, Don? Yeah. Yeah, i just uh, like to give a pitch also for Thursday's event, the Central uh, Wisconsin Agenda on Water Week. Uh, on Thursday, we have uh, at 10:30 we have the uh, restoration of Little Plover River. Uh, Aaron O'Brien and Tracy Hames are going to be presenting. At 11:30, uh, Mr. Provost, along with Mr. Oldenburg, will be talking about the water quality in the Wisconsin River Basin. And then um, at 1:15 to 2:15, we're going to have a dual presentations. Uh, one with the EPIC, uh, Eau Plaine Partnership for Integrated Conservation, talking about relationships. And then uh, Rick Georgeson and uh, John Aaron will be talking after them. So that's on Thursday for the Central Wisconsin uh, agenda mm -hmm. on, on Water Week. Yeah. Thanks um, for adding that, Scott. Um, and, and those also, are. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Don. Oh, I, I, I just want to say thank you for adding that. Um, those are those are all good sessions. And then one other announcement. I'm currently they're also talking right now on Wisconsin Water Week about the NR 151 targeted performance standards, and um, uh, I know that uh, our far-reaching east end of the watershed, I believe is, is in that geographic region. Mm -hmm. um, what I've just learned in the last 20 minutes is that uh, they're in the process, this is a rule process and uh, uh, they have uh, about another year, I think the middle of next year before it would become, you know, uh, through uh, the process and, and law. But um, again, uh, that's a nitrogen standard and that, that'll be a good thing down the road for 14 miles. Mm -hmm. it, it's good for, yeah, especially in the Central Sands area, it's gonna be very beneficial. And there's uh, some farmers, some large producers already that are, um, they're already working on some real innovative things, which I, I just learned last week. So I was pretty pumped up to hear that. I mean, they're on this, on the ball here and they're, they're actually planning ahead now in anticipation of it, so. Sounds like it's good, you know, it's heading in the right direction. Thanks, Scott. I was just able to uh, get on uh, 
with all this computer mess that I've had, and I didn't hear everything that Scott said, but um, as far, uh, I just uh, got notice from the DNR that they're asking for um, public comment on draft economic impact analysis regarding nitrate pollution groundwater uh, comment date deadline April 10th. If anybody needs a link to the rest of this, uh, uh, I'll be happy to email it. But uh, uh, if it's not the same thing as what uh, Scott was talking about, I think maybe uh, we need to either as a group or privately chime in on this. It, no, it is, John. But you you know, that's a really good idea, folks. This is the 14 mile Creek watershed where to get together, get some whatever. I'm not going to interfere. I want you guys to speak for yourselves, but uh, get in come in as a as, as a club or a team or organization and say this is our position the suggestions um john could you share that please and send it along i don't think i've seen that or i haven't gotten that deep in the pile yet sure i'll happy i'll be happy uh, and, and as another caveat regarding that uh you can get all of the uh information that the dnr puts out by subscribing to it uh, I can't tell you just exactly how to do it, but uh, I get uh, a load of information every day from their public source. So uh, I'll send you the uh, the link that I've got here, Don. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's um, again the, the timing is really great, um, uh, Scott and um, Scott Bordeaux and what you mentioned about NR 151 uh, is coming just at the right time for us. Uh, the other thing I would uh, uh, mention, and, and uh, Scott Berto, thanks for reminding me about that. Uh, we sent out links uh, to some of the, what we thought were the key sessions going on in particular on Thursday and Friday um, that we thought those of you involved in the committee would uh, be interested in. Uh, the one, one session that I think is pretty interesting is uh, uh, Tracy Arnold heads up a group in uh, Portage County, the Lakes and Rivers group, uh, which as I understand it, uh, was just recently formed and they are having a session uh, following ours. Uh, I'm pretty sure theirs is at two o'clock. If you look at that information that I sent out uh, about a week or so ago, it should be listed there. I think that uh, that would be great synergy uh, to develop a relationship with them. So um, that's all I have under announcements. Anything else uh, someone, anyone wants to bring up? Okay. All right, then we'll move on. And um, next item on the agenda is um, our guest speaker. And uh, let me introduce him. Uh, David Trimner is with us today. Um, Wave hello to David. He's general manager of Miltrim Farms in Athens, Wisconsin, which is in Marathon County. They are the largest automated dairy in Wisconsin and the only farm in all of North America to be AWS certified. And that's the Alliance for Water Stewardship. And that's done through Clearwater Farms program of uh, the Rivers Alliance. Uh, the program guides farms and processing facilities through a rigorous certification of their on-site and supply chain water management using the AWS International Water Stewardship Standard, uh, the world's only comprehensive industry water use standard. And as members of EPIX, uh, who Scott Berdeau uh, mentioned is uh, doing a presentation on Thursday, uh, they're members of the uh, EPIC, which is the Oplane Partnership for Integrated Conservation. Uh, they understand the relationship between healthy soil and healthy water, the very thing that we've learned. Um, David will discuss the farm's background, describe their operation, and share the approach to good soil and water stewardship. So with that introduction, uh, welcome, David. Thanks, Don. Appreciate it. I'm glad to be here with all you guys and uh, looking forward to kind of telling you a little bit about uh, what we do here at the farm. So let me share my screen here and we will get started. All righty. So first, I just kind of want to tell you guys a little bit about um, the farm and, and what that kind of looks like. So uh, again, we're Miltrum Farms over in Athens, Wisconsin, and we were established in 1988, and that was started by my dad, Scott Trimner, and my uncle, Scott, uh, Scott Tom Miller. Um, at that point, uh, uh, both my dad and my uncle had grown up on farms, and so conservation has kind of been a long-held family practice. My grandpa, which would be Tom's dad, that'd be Martin Miller, he had won some awards for conservation 
Um, he, he used to do uh, strip contouring and, and some kind of interesting things to, to uh, help mitigate and, uh, soil erosion and whatnot on his farm, uh, which actually is where I live now, at the home, home farm and in the home house. Um, at that time, uh, when they started in 88, we were milking about 40 cows. And throughout the years now, we've kind of grown, obviously, to the size we are now, which is milking about 2,800. And that's going to be about 1,700 in the parlor you see in the background, and then uh, 1,100 in our robot facility, uh, which will soon to be uh, 1,800, and so, um, which is pretty exciting. And then along with that, obviously, uh, lots of acres to feed those cows. And so we're, we crop about 5,000 acres, and that's split between corn uh, and alfalfa grass mix for hay, and then a little bit of oats as well, just to throw in a kind of a mixture of things. So what got us started? So for us, you know, water is really important to our families. Um, I remember uh, as a kid, we would we'd go up to my uh, aunt and uncles in uh, Park Falls, and we'd go on out on the lake in Phillips there and, and go tubing and whatnot. I know Tom is a big uh, fisherman. He really likes uh, fly fishing and whatnot. And so, you know, water is just really important. Uh, we all live here. Uh, we all drink the water from uh, the wells we have uh, in the country. And so we want to have good quality water. And, uh, you know, surface water is, a, is a definitely a big issue in Wisconsin, um, particularly with the phosphorus when it comes to surface water runoff. And so that's something that's, that's, that we don't want to uh, be a problem. We want to be a solution up, up for that issue. Um, for us, we have a lot of fields that are high risk for erosion. Um, for our, our soils are pretty heavy. And so with the slope, if, if they if they lay bare for too long, uh, you're going to have issues and you're going to have erosion. And, and that's really, um, that's really one of the big reasons uh, for pollution is just the soil running off, uh, and into, uh, the streams and lakes. And then that just really causes a lot of problems. Um, another reason our, our watershed is kind of a big issue in our County marathon County, because we're one of the highest percentage of acres for corn silage. And more corn silage is a great crop in the sense that it provides a lot of good uh, nutritional feed for the cows. Um, it also leaves the soil up about as bare as it can be. And so you got to tackle that with uh, different practices and, and planting cover crops uh, within the corn to, to kind of help mitigate that. And again, I kind of talked, you know, our, we got heavy soils, particularly where we are. And uh, those heavy soils need to be protected. Um, you know, they don't, uh, without proper management, uh, water does not infiltrate. It just hits the soil and breaks it up and, and washes it away. So just to talk a little bit more about our commitment to, to all this. So again, we were uh, the first farm that was uh, Clearwater Farm certified uh, in North America. And um, what that involved was a pretty long process for us because we were the first farm of kind of putting in, in documentation and and planning and figuring out what um, what are our practices, what are our goals, and, and how do we get there? And so that's one thing. This um, this certification, there's not a particular set bar that you start out as. Um, the the purpose of it is to is to strive to continually improve. Obviously, there's a baseline yet. You know, you still need to be in compliance and be doing, um, you know, be doing right by the by the land, but. Uh, um, even just us, for example, as we go through the presentation, you'll be able to see different pictures of cover crops just kind of off to the side, like the one you see here. And this one is, is an example of a, a tremendous field with great cover crops. And then some of the other pictures, they look pretty good, but um, we want to continue to improve, continue to get thicker and thicker cover crops to have more, more of a benefit, especially um, because we have to haul manure. And so we need the cover crops to sustain through that. And I'll kind of go through that a little bit as we, as we get into it. And then um, again, the, we get an audit every 18 months. Um, and this is the third party audit for this um, certification. So it's uh, very legitimate and uh, it's, it's something we take very seriously. And it, it just kind of helps us continue to push uh, changes and the goals that we have here on the farm. So let's kind of talk about the practices. Um, so again, right now we're doing as much no-till and minimum till as possible. Uh, that's uh, very important for a variety of reasons. Uh, we Again, we like to utilize the cover crops to have growth year-round. Um, by doing that, uh, cover crops and no-till are a good hand-in-hand -hand kind of thing. 
Uh, we also incorporate water savings practices on the farm. Um, so obviously one big part of this is, is not just how do we handle surface water, but also how do we handle the groundwater that we'd have? Um, you know, we want to use it as wisely as possible. And we want to make sure that every gallon is going uh, to the best use that it can be. Um, dairy farms obviously use quite a bit of water because you're, you're making a lot of milk and dairy cows drink uh, quite a few gallons of water every day. So uh, let's put that water to good use and, and uh, get the most out of it that we can. Um, another one, of course, is the responsible and productive manure use and handling. Uh, one thing I like to say that we've tried to transition into is, is no longer treating manure as a waste, but treating it as a fertilizer and treating it very importantly. And I think that's uh, a big deal. And then the last thing that we're kind of experimenting with and, and have been doing more and more of is removing unproductive land uh, to create buffers and plots. And I'll get into that a little later. So no-till, let's talk about that for a bit. So uh, basically, you know, what that involves is just not tilling the ground. Um, you know, the practices that we used to always do, we love to see, you know, black soil before we planted. And uh, that's really not something we need to do anymore. Uh, so when you, when you practice these no-till practices, what you're doing is basically allowing the soil to keep its structure. And so when you pull a plow through the ground, you're, you're damaging that soil. It's not something that's beneficial to it. Um, it, uh, it fractures that soil and now that soil does not have any, any structure. And because of that, um, it kind of, it, it'll, it doesn't uh, facilitate good, good, uh, water permeability. Um, it, obviously the soil, because it's loose and in place, it can run off easier. Uh, some things that we've had to do, uh, it, it, you can see in the picture, it, it's called a, a no-till corn planter. And so there are, are, there are different types of equipment that you need to purchase in order to do some of these practices. Um, but for us, that was an investment that was, that was very, um, we were willing to make that. Um, and by doing that, uh, the planter does a great job of, of, of uh, planting into a, a no-till scenario. And then for the hay ground, we still do uh, some minimal tillage and we're kind of working our way out of that as well to do just uh, no-till um, in that application also. So some just kind of the little benefits that we do the no-till for is, is the fields are firmer. So again, because I talked about the, the structure, um, when you destroy that structure, you just, you just ba basically made a sponge. So the, the soil gets wet, it turns into a wet sponge and you drive on that and now it's just, it just muck out there. But whereas when you leave the soil alone and it has that structure, water can permeate through, um, but it stays in place. And so by doing that, you can get your equipment out on the fields faster. And that's, that's a big deal. I mean, being able to plant corn on say May 5th versus May 10th, because uh, on May 5th, the, the soils would have been too wet uh, for you to get out there without doing damage. Uh, that's a big deal for us. Ask a question now, or you want to wait till the end? Um, if you'd like to, but otherwise generally uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it at the end as well. But okay. You, I'll, I'll just do it at the end. Cause you might answer it. Then are here oh. in the next, see in the next slide. Thank you. Okay. No, that's no problem. Yeah. So again, uh, cover crops and no-till definitely go hand in hand. Um, so one thing we, we started the cover crops and no-till about six years ago. Uh, so it's definitely something we've been experimenting with before we got the certification. Um, so again, the certification is kind of a good, a driver for us to continue to, to improve on those practices. And so the first experimentation that we had with cover crops was actually a drilling ryegrass post silage harvest. Um, but obviously over time, things change. And one thing that had changed for us is we'd switched to BMR corn silage because it was more, it was more um, digestible for the cow. And so because of that, we had to harvest later because it was just naturally a longer day corn. And so we didn't have that time frame to drill um, all of our corn or all of our, our cover crop in after it just would be too much and it'd get too late that that cover crop would fail. So what we did is we purchased what you see here is an air seeder. And so how it works is basically um, you fill it with seed and uh, uh, it, the seed runs through tubing and is um, kind of sprayed out in between the corn rows. And so by doing this, um, you can get that seed established in the early summer and get things growing pretty quickly. One thing that we've learned is that it's really important to, um, uh, to put this on early enough uh, uh, before the corn canopies uh, too quickly. So we, we used to um, 
try to put the cover crops on at about V4, which just means uh, there's four leaves on the corn plant. And so by doing it at that time, uh, if we got it in quick enough, um, it would be okay. But if we were, if, if, if the growing season really turned good and, and the corn grew fast, uh, it would canopy and then that uh, cover crop would die because it would not be able to get established versus now we're putting it on uh, shortly after the corn is up. And by doing that, this gives the cover crop plenty of time to get established and get some good growth into it, uh, still without hurting the corn, because that's obviously important. You don't want to, you don't want to stunt your growth, um, but you get that in there, it gets a good establishment. And then by the time it's the corn's canopied, uh, you've got some good growth there. And then when you harvest, now you're, you, you know, you've got a good thick cover crop there that's going to continue to flourish uh, as the, as the, um, the last of the warmth of the year is it's exposed to that and to that sunshine. So um, there's a lot of different varieties that we use and the varieties all kind of have a special purpose. And so um, some of the main ones, you know, you know I talked about uh, that cereal rye that we did at the end of the year. Um, one reason why we do that one is, is it's really good at alleviating compaction. And so when you do go into a field, uh, you know, let's look at 2019, for example, uh, 2019 was a very wet year. And so there was plenty of areas, particularly headlands that had some compaction because of the heavy equipment and the poor soil conditions. Well, rise in particular are really great at alleviating that. The root system goes very deep and it breaks through any hard pan that you put in its way. And so by doing that, um, we break up that compaction without having to use tillage, which is was one of the big um, things kind of the big challenges that we had to get around um, when we first started with cover crops. Um, I, again, nutrients sequestration is another one as well as weed suppression and kind of a thick biomass. And so basically, you know, cover crops, they're great because they provide more plant matter and more, and more root structure to capture nutrients. So particularly after harvest in the fall, um, you chop the corn silage off. Now you've got all this green growing there that can, uh, make use of that manure when you put it down and then uh and then it uh, you know stores that in the soil and stores that in the plant so then for next year it's available and, and usable and it stays in place um, again we use an annual rye that's again for more compaction and then uh, also for some spring green uh, we also use a couple different types of clovers and so the clovers are really nice because they fixate nitrogen which is just basically taking nitrogen uh, out of the atmosphere and turning it into a usable form. And um, by doing that, you potentially can use less nitrogen in an application. Uh, it's not a tremendous amount, but anything counts. And uh, that's just some, uh, some savings on inputs that you have when you have uh, plants doing it for you. Um, again, the, the, those clovers, they provide a lot of biomass and they also are spring green. And then white clover actually handles wet spots really well. So if you've got kind of a lower area um, the white clover flourishes in that spot. So you don't have uh, uh, just a bare spot there. A couple other uh, types of cover crops are uh, cowpeas. Um, again, they fixate nitrogen and are very tall and viney. Uh, so they just pro provide a lot of uh, plant matter. Uh, hairy vetch as well, biomass. Um, it's a biannual, so it'll come up green. And then it fixate nitrogen. And then the last one is, is rapeseed. So one thing that's interesting about that is uh, if I go back here, rapeseed is the, is the very big leafy plants that you see in this photo here on the bottom. And so what's nice about those is that you, we plant those to help um, knock down insects because instead of feeding on the corn, the insects are going to uh, tackle that first because it's lower to the ground. They're gonna tackle that, feed off that, be satisfied. And now you don't have to worry about uh, potentially utilizing some um, insecticide to, to knock that down. Um, by all means, the rapeseed does not tackle every insect, but some of your more common ones, um, it, it'll, it'll help mitigate that and keep that at bay to help protect the corn, which is just kind of a cool way um, to use nature to, to uh, protect your, the, the plants that you're trying to grow. So, so again, just kind of some of the benefits uh, to these, because obviously these, these, um, these practices are, are really great for the environment and they're great for the conservation, but you also want them to pay off for the farmer as well, because um, obviously farmers have to be profitable to maintain the farm. So one of the big things is removing the cost of multiple passes through a field. For us, 
uh, pulling a chisel plow through the field is an, ex is an expensive endeavor because you're using your largest tractor, uh, which has got a lot of horsepower, uh, uses a lot of fuel and just costs a lot to purchase. And so by removing that pass, um, you're saving quite a bit of money. Um, again, we talked about that soil structure. Uh, so by improving that soil structure through good root systems and through not breaking up that soil, you improve that water permeability as well as the holding capacity. And so uh, that's a beneficial because as uh, climate gets a little bit more and more um, varied and we get bigger rainfalls, uh, the soil will have more capacity to hold that water. And then if it, if it can't hold it all, the water that's going to you know, flow off is going to be clean because the soil will not be in that. Another thing is it, is, uh, it improves the soil microbiome. And so that's something that we've kind of been really learning more and more about um, over the past few years is that microbiome and what that looks like. Um, just like humans have a kind of a microbiome in their gut, soils also have a microbiome which helps break down uh, minerals and micronutrients. Uh, one thing that we learned recently uh, was that potentially as we, as we put potash on our soils to, uh, to improve the potassium levels, um, we might potentially be, be uh, killing some of the microbes which help make potassium more available to the plants. So you might be trying to do one thing, uh, but then hurting yourself in another realm because uh, with, with potash, it's, it's very high in, I think it's chloride. Um, and so that's, it just, it hurts the, that microbiome and can potentially hurt you in the long run. Um, it also improves organic matter. Now that's obviously something that's going to take uh, many years and decades to start to see big changes, but uh, I'd rather see in slow, small, tiny improvements in, in organic matter than, than small and tiny um, losing of organic matter throughout the years. So uh, that's definitely worthwhile. And it's, it's a big, big part of the cover crops. So, and then again, it creates that firmer field. Uh, so it's easier to get into with equipment. And uh, one example I have is a few years ago, we, we um, had harvested a field. Uh, I want to say it was corn silage. And um, uh, right across the road was a, a neighbor who was also harvesting his corn silage. And we, we, we were done and they were still trying to harvest theirs. And it was just muddy and rutted and they were, you know, dragging tractors to the field. And we went in and, and uh, actually um, injected manure onto our field. And um, when we did it, the soil was firm. Uh, the conditions were, were pretty darn good. So it was just the night and day difference showing um, what, uh, you know, moldboard plowing, con con conventional tillage, what that can do uh, to the soil and the structure versus just leaving the soil alone and, and letting it do its thing. So that was, uh, that was an eye opener for us. So again, uh, another important part is uh, how we use the water on the farm. And so we're trying to utilize technologies to help lower our water use on farm. Um, one thing we do is we, we flush um, in the robot farm, we flush all the alleys. And so we use good, um, we use good like manure cleaning technology, such as a centrifuge and rotary screens to help clean up that flush water. It's basically a brown water or a gray water. So it's not, it's not, you're not throwing in clean water into this. You're just reusing what you have, that manure water and uh, uh, making a better flush out of it through these technologies. Another thing that um, we're utilizing is, is really good ventilation. In the robot barn in particular, we, um, we've realized that we won't have to put in any kind of water uh, for cow cooling because we invested a lot in ventilation and so it'll use a little more electricity, but we're gonna save on water, which uh, is important because the less water we use on farm, the less manure we have to haul out uh, uh, during the year. And that's really important. So by doing that, um, we keep the cows cool, uh, and save on water. So it's kind of a win-win. Another thing we're trying to do, uh, particularly with our waters for the cows is, is keep them shallow. So instead of filling them plump full, uh, we fill them uh, to a shallow level enough for the cows to drink properly, but, uh, not so much, um, uh, that, that you're, you know, you're filling them all away because obviously you want to have the cows to have clean waters. And so when you clean that, you're dumping that out. And so by keeping that water shallow, we are saving on water use um, th through that water that we're dumping out. And so that's just a simple thing that we've uh, tried to do to kind of help make a difference. And then the other thing that um, we, we've heard more about and have started to notice ourselves is, is with robots, you start to save water. 
Um, with big parlors, you got a lot of fire hoses rinsing down the parlor and uh, using a lot of water. And with the robots, because you're on a small scale, you, you can be more precise with how you use the water and thus you're, you're, you're using less of it. And so that's been a, a pretty cool to see. And um, I know other farms have seen that as well, especially farms that do a pure retrofit and take out their parlor and put in robots. Uh, they're, they're definitely seeing a difference. And then another thing that we utilized, um, we do have some sprinklers in our, our other facilities. And uh, we recently swapped out every nozzle in those sprinklers to just make them more efficient to, to be really highly efficient water nozzles. Um, and one thing that we try to do with that is to use only as much water as needed. Um, so it's really easy with sprinklers and, and uh, soakers to overuse on water. And so uh, we try to be pretty particular on using just enough water to get the cow wet um, without, you know, uh, using a bunch that just runs off and goes on the ground and, and using exactly what the cow needs to keep her cool. So obviously again, with, with cows, you have manure and uh, you know, manure can be a blessing or a curse depending on how you look at it. And so responsible manure handling is, is very important. Um, one thing uh, we did quite a while ago now is we switched from a tillage style manure shank to a, kind of a low disturbance injection bar. So basically all that, that injection bar that you see there is doing is just making a slit for the manure to go into and then kind of covering it back up again. And we've actually used this piece of equipment on like an old growing hay crop stand and had good success with it. Um, another thing we do is we utilize a drag hose uh, right from either the manure pits themselves or, or from trucks uh, to a, a, what's called a frack tank, basically a big dumpster. And by doing this, we help keep a lot of excess weight off of one off of the roads, but also off of the fields. Um, and that helps with compaction and helps with keeping the soil uh, healthy and the plant and the plant matter there as best as possible. Another tool that we um, are utilizing, and I tried to get a picture of this beforehand, but I couldn't, I couldn't get one for my, my crop guy is, is we are using a dribble bar on the hay ground. And so because we switched from an all alfalfa hay stand to a mixture with grasses, we're putting a kind of a low rate of manure onto that once a year after each cutting. So after say one cutting, we'll, we'll do about a third of the acres. And then after another cutting, we'll do another third. And we use this dribble bar because what it does basically is it places the manure right at the soil level, but it doesn't, it doesn't dig in at all. It doesn't, it just places it there through um, a bunch of hoses. And by doing it like that versus like a traditional top spreading, there's a lot less odor and you're not spraying the plants. Um, you're just getting it right to the soil. It, it uh, immediately in, infiltrates into the soil and the plant starts utilizing that manure as, it, as it's being broken down. And that's been really, really cool to see. Um, and then the other big thing is spreading at lower rates. Uh, for us on the farm, we shoot for about 7,000 gallons an acre in a non-corn ground. So in like that hay, hay ground that I talked about and 10,000 gallons an acre for corn ground. And so that's really important uh, to keep our rates low. And uh, thankfully we, we, we have plenty of land mass to do that, especially now. Oh, that wait. What, what was that? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I think dog was freaking out. I didn't know my mic was unmuted. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Nope. No problem. Um, anyways. And so, uh, by, by spreading those lower rates, you're, uh, one, you're, you're helping that soil microbiome again. If you're spread really heavy manure rates, you're going to, you're going to do some damage there. And then also you're just, uh, very much mitigating the possibility of, uh, of, ha uh, having runoff and just having the manure and the nutrients leave the, uh, leave the, the field. So then the last thing that we have been working on is putting in buffer strips and then taking unproductive ground um, out of production. And so what we're doing is we're utilizing our field maps and our yield monitors uh, to kind of pick out the poor, either the poor areas or just the poor fields and, and kind of making a plan on how we tackle that. So with the buffer strips, um, we find a field, for example, we have a field um, that's, it was 62 acres and we took eight of those acres that was on, on the edge of the, the south edge of the field. We took those eight acres out of corn silage production because it was consistently poor, poor yielding, uh, money losing area. And so by taking that out and planting it into uh, perennial grasses and for, for hay, we can still harvest that uh, for heifers and whatnot. 
Um, but we'll get more out of it because the grasses are going to handle that poor soil better. And then the other perk of that is now you have a buffer strip in a low area, so it can better capture any nutrient that may be leaving the field for whatever reason. Or if you have heavy rains, uh, the, that, that water is going to flow through that thick mat of grass first uh, before it can leave the field. So that's been really cool. And we, we, um, we saw some improvement on that 62 acre field this year. It was, it was $11 an acre more profitable by doing that than by not doing it. And the other cool thing is some of these are, are program sponsored. So even this one, um, you get a little bit of money per acre to help cover all that seed costs or, or, or um, uh, to cover the initial cost of uh, kind of getting yourself started, but you can still harvest it. Other, other um, options are uh, putting in, you know, putting your land in CRP or Monarch and honeybee pots. And we've actually done that as well. I think there's one 15 acre field, particularly where we just took it out of production. It was not worth harvesting. Um, and so we put that into, uh, I think it was a Monarch, uh, Monarch plot. And those are generally more expensive to, to buy the seed and to plant them. And so it's nice to have different programs that are, are going to incentivize you to, to do that. Um, and by doing that, we're um, uh, just making more habitat for the species that we need. Um, the, the monarchs and the honeybees, uh, they're very important, obviously, to the local ecosystem. And so we want that to, to uh, be there. And then another thing that we're trying to work on now is, uh, is to kind of create, um, create a, a well recharge uh, near the farm. So obviously, uh, with all the cows, the cows drink lots of water, and so we pull, pull plenty of water from the wells. And we want to, um, kind of, put in place uh, certain catch and base basins and catchments to help slow water down when you have a rain event because we have plenty of acres of roof, and uh, and gravel here at the farm that all flow through uh, our, our stormwater pipes and then go out to uh, this field that's just be just west of the farm. And so we want to be able to kind of slow that down and allow that to permeate the soil and help recharge the wells even more. Um, Cause we have enough, enough, you know, acreage that we, we can more than recharge our whole year's water use in just the summer. And so obviously we get big recharges in spring and, uh, and some in the then fall, but we want to, you know, we want to be able to uh, use water all year round uh, to help recharge those wells and, and keep them full and, and uh, be able to have water for, for generations to come. So that's something else that we're kind of working on and we're pretty excited about. So, so just some, uh, you know, closing comments, um, conservation, it brings a lot of added value to the dairy. Uh, you know, some things here, obviously it improves that soil health. That's really important to, I think, having um, crops that are going to be successful for years to come is, is having good soil health and good microbiome. Um, again, it, it, it better captures the manure nutrients. I mean, you can see in the picture, being able to have some green on there when you plant or when you uh, inject the manure is going, to, um, is going to help you know that the manure is going to be able to get captured and utilized right away. And that's pretty important. Um, again, it allows easier access to fields uh, because of the fact that the, the, the fields are firmer. Uh, we can get in there quicker, and that's, that's pretty, pretty powerful and, and makes for a very, uh, very um, important aspect of, of all these practices. Uh, we, we don't see any yield loss from planting cover crops, which is also really important. Um, I know a lot of people would push back on these if, if you started to see yield losses in your crops, but that's not something we see. It's, it's more of like a companion crop. This is what, uh, uh, what some people like to call it. And so it works alongside uh, your main crop that you're trying to harvest and, and doesn't hinder it. It's kind of a symbiotic relationship. And again, we just want to promote productive soils and clean water for generations. Um, one thing I heard um, not too long ago is that at, at the current rate of soil loss that we have, we could have uh, almost nearly unproductive soils in 60 years. And that's only 60 more harvests that we can utilize to, to grow food on. And that's kind of a pretty scary thing. Um, I think we want to uh, start to reverse that trend and, and continue to build up our soils and, and uh, make them better and better and, and um, allow us to grow that extra food that we're going to need to grow for all the people uh, who are going to be here in 60 years. So um, with that, uh, I would take any questions now that uh, anyone would have. 
Uh, this is Carson Heineke. I've got two questions for you. Uh, one is, do you have a high groundwater table in your area? Uh, yes, we do. Yeah, groundwater is very, uh, very close to the surface. Okay. So the second thing is, other than manure, do you, do you utilize any other type of fertilizer? Yes, we still, um, we, we use um, uh, starter and some uh, nitrogen for, uh, for our corn. For our, so when we, when we plant corn, we'll put a little bit of two by two down, which is just nitrogen right next to the seed, as well as some starter. And then we'll, we will go back and do a second application of, of nitrogen, so. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Yes. Um, thanks so much for coming, David. You really explained that very well and we really appreciate it. My question is this, um, have you ever thought about doing composting teas or anything like that on your soil to improve the biomass? Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, we, we were just, we just started thinking about that. Like what would composting look like and how could we utilize that? So it's definitely something we actually have an area pre-prepared that if we wanted to do something, we'd have it available and ready. So we're not entirely sure what that looks like, um, but we're definitely doing some research on that. So I know some farms have tried it and then tried to sell the product. Um, I don't know if that's, I know that's really hard to do, but uh, just to be able to maybe compost it and then yeah, have that as a soil additive, even on your far away soils, I think would be you know potentially something that would be really beneficial. And the reason I bring that up is because I watched and I encourage you to watch this. There was a great documentary called The Biggest Little Farm. Have you heard about that one? No, I've not. Mm. It's really good. It's about a farm in California. So it's a different environment completely, but they used a, uh, a compost tea to re revitalize their soils and they did it within four years. Really? The where the biomass was unbelievable. So oh. Um, it was the, they, they were breaking ground on it. And the other question I have real quickly is, do you ever let your cows out to pasture feed at all or not? So uh, we cannot, uh, the DNR will not let us. But one thing we did do last year, which is pretty exciting for us because we can't personally, we have um, a neighbor who we rent most of his land from, but he has some of it yet for his, his grazing, uh, his grass fed beef. And so after we harvested the corn silage uh, on the land that we rent from him, uh, he let his beef out and pastured the uh, cover crop. So that's something I think we'll continue to try doing with him. So. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Dave, here comes a big question. <laughs> so how did the uh, use of the cover crops affect your profitability? Um, so that, no, that's a great question. Well, one of the big things again is um, not having to do multiple passes in the field. That's going to be a bit, that's a big savings for us. Another thing um, is going to be, you know, kind of have, you know, better utilizing the manure nutrients um, and the manure credits that we get from that. So we have, we don't have to use quite as much for uh, synthetic fertilizer. That's a, a big, a big perk. And then I think the other big one that is really important again, is the fact that we can harvest and plant easier because the cover crops provide, especially the cover crops, they provide a really good, like um, a very good kind of mat for equipment to drive on. And so even in, in wetter conditions, um, doing one pass over, over one area, that, that first pass, the cover crops really kind of hold up equipment nicely. So I, I think there's a, I actually, I know there's a ton of value in being able to do those things a bit earlier or a bit later, you know, timing of, for example, if, if, you're, uh, um, if your corn is ready to harvest and you can't get out there because it's so wet or, or, or particularly planting, if you can, you know, plant your corn five or, five or six days earlier, um, that could be a big difference in, in how it thrives for the rest of the year. That's a really good point that you bring up that because uh, you increase your soil health and the structure of the soil by having those cover crops and roots act as that kind of a mesh to mm -hmm. keep your equipment up on top so it doesn't rut in. You can at least in some what falls get to your crop when some other guys can't. Yeah. yeah. So no, I mean especially on heavier soil. Yeah. So on heavier soils, you know what that's a total loss if you can't harvest. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Yeah, so the, and the reason why I'm asking about profitability is because look, you guys are doing great stuff. I mean, it, that's exactly what we need to do to improve water quality. And you're going to hear about this others on Thursday. We need a million acres of cover crops to get to meet our water quality goals in, in Lake Pete and Lake Petenwell. So if, if we can show if you can show that it's profitable mm -hmm. or it increases your profit per acre. Or maybe you know it just increases your profit per acre, not necessarily yield, but your profit that because that considers all the running back and forth on your with your equipment, your time, everything else, and the use of uh, more efficient use of your manure. Right, exactly. It's a win-win. It's a win-win. No, exactly. And actually, um, that's a good point, Scott, because um, it was a, a couple weeks ago now, but uh, I I did a talk for the Farm Profitability Expo, and so it was. A similar slideshow, but geared towards specifically towards profitability. So I had a few more points in there that off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you, but I had quite a few, you know, decent things in there. And so, yeah, I, cause I know that's important to people. And if you, um, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah. If you don't, if it's not economical, no farmer's going to do it. And I can honestly say that we would never go back. I mean, it's, it's, it's too worthwhile and too, too useful for us to, to just to want to stop especially you know obviously cover crops you have that seed cost but it's still so valuable but especially no-till i mean to, to to go back and dave what you just said is huge that that's huge that you you guys wouldn't go back because you did yeah it's kind of kind of risky because your profit margin isn't great to begin with it's kind of risky to try something new but when you try to get now if you could just get other farmers to do it and that's where we're, we're going to rely on folks like you and, mm -hmm. and epic to you know spread that word another one scott too actually is um chemical cost you know you're, you're we, we still definitely use chemical and and we will have to for i'm sure a while uh you know that's something that's going to be really hard to try to fully get away from but um definitely you know using less chemical because you have the cover crops for weed suppression and also like i talked about the bugs and whatnot uh, so that was important and that's a cost saving. So, and a lot of what you're doing right now could be we could use that over here in the Central Sands area where it's mostly vegetable, potato, and vegetable growing. Mm -hmm. You know, understand certain crops they can't because they can't, uh, like snap beans or peas, they can't have that trash in there. Yeah, from from the cover crops. But there's no absolutely no reason why you couldn't do it for sweet corn or potatoes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, or sugar beets or carrots. Yeah. So, no, that's a great point. I don't think. You know, that's not my realm, so I don't think much about that or what that looks like. But, yeah, I, I think getting, getting all of them. Maybe it should be your realm. Maybe you should start growing <laughs> veggies over here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> One last question for you. How old are you? I'm 28. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to say, David, the one uh, fact that you brought up that I think stuck with me the most was that in 60 years, we could lose, um, we could have unproductive soils. I mean, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I hope you get that word out to any farmer you meet because that's huge. If we don't have soils, we're into the dust bowl again. R right, and actually another good point to that, that I'd heard on a, a podcast was, um, was that there's companies like Nestle and a few other really big food companies that are starting to look into if they aren't already doing this is actually paying their suppliers a bit more to, to do these practices. And it wasn't consumer driven. It was driven by the fact that this is their whole world is selling food. So if there's no food to sell, they're bankrupt. And so I, I just, I couldn't believe that, but that was their driver. It was not even consumer driven, which is most of changes in the marketplace. It was, what happens when we can't grow food in 60 years? What am I, as Nestle, what am I buying? I'm, I can't buy anything. I'm going broke. So I just, that was powerful to me when I heard that. So, yeah. So. Yeah, that's yeah, here, Dave. Um, I have a question in regard to uh, both no-till and cover crops. Um, are you uh, familiar with any producer-led groups uh, down here in the sand country? Uh, that uh, expose or, or expound uh, the uh, goodness of uh, these two uh, 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 situations. Uh, we're in the process of uh, helping to uh, uh, better the quality of our water here in the watershed. And uh, Scott had mentioned both the uh, vegetable growers and uh, the potato people. 
um, again, uh, is it a, a situation where uh, we know of a, a number of producer-led councils up in the heavy soil country. Uh, our soil is very, very different here. Um, any comments on that? Um, that's a good point. I, I'm not entirely sure about different groups in that area, but just one thing I will say about that is, I think I think cover crops no-till are a solution to two types of problem. And for us with the heavy soils, it's phosphorus and phosphorus runoff. And for you guys with the light soils, it's nitrate, see, you know, seeping through and into the groundwater and all that stuff. And so, I, I think for us protecting the soils, utilizing that phosphorus. But for you, protecting the soils and capturing and utilizing that that nitrogen that's used, you know, for, with the cover crops, I think that's really important. Um, but I'm not entirely sure. It looks like someone just. Um, no, maybe yeah, not. that was Scott. Yeah. Um, and yes, uh, to answer your question, I test water here in our, our watershed mm -hmm. and the nitrates are definitely the highest on our list as far as uh, something to ameliorate. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have one more question. Uh, do you do any irrigation? We do not, no. Mm -mm. Okay. Thank you. I had a quick question. Uh, so I loved your analogy of comparing soil microbiome to kind of the stomach microbiome. Um, you know, both concepts are really, really new uh, to, to science. You know, there's not a whole lot we understand in either realm, um, but it's becoming more and more popular. And we're realizing that, you know, bacteria really are what kind of govern a lot of our natural systems. Um, so I'm wondering when, when did you uh, really start incorporating that that concept of the soil microbiome into your management strategy? Um, I'd say that has been more along in the last year or two um, because we've kind of learned more. And, and uh, the thing I talked about, the potash, um, we learned that just a few months ago. So not to say that that's 100% accurate, but it, it makes sense that, again, I think, I think potash is a lot of chlor chloride or something. And so that kind of burns and kills off that, that microbiome, which, again, potentially... Um, could be the reason why for us, we, we just, it seems like we're always low in potassium in our soils. And so it seems like we have to put on more and more potash. Well, is there something else there? What, like, why is this? Um, so yeah, potassium chloride. Yep. So, uh, so yeah, so that's just something, there's another type of potassium you can put on, but it's very expensive. Um, so we might experiment with a small amount of it on a small field, but yeah, so that's, that's interesting. So, and the other, just kind of the random fact for everyone is, is it's, it seems like the microbiome in humans in the gut is a huge proponent of like mental health and ha having, you know, issues in that realm of, of that really can hurt you there. So it's, it's a big deal. So I'd like to think that a healthy soil microbiome, which is where we, our food comes from can potentially, uh, you know, string down to the next, the next species that eats in the next, and you know, all that. So kind of affecting everything in a big circle, you could say. Actually, um, just so you know, David, my son is totally into nutrition mm -hmm. and he completely convinced his old parents to eat organic and grass fed. Yeah. And the reason is because there's more nutrients, not as much as there should be because, you know, in the United States, we've kind of ruined our crop fields, but there's more nutrients than in regular processed foods. So mm -hmm. that completely makes sense. And also it's the immune system. The stomach is the immune system in a human. Yeah, so it right. keeps you, yeah, from getting diseases like, you know, getting sick and all. Mm -hmm. so it is all it's all tied in. Crazy to think okay. those tiny little soldiers can do so much. Mm -hmm. Hey, okay. any yeah. other questions for David? Yes. Um, David, I'm just really impressed with all the changes that you've made to incorporate all these practices in your farm. What was the driving factor behind it that really got you started to begin with? Oh, that's a good question. It, it was, I'd have to say it was some of the water issues that we were seeing in Wisconsin. Cause again, this, so, so I've been, you know, this is my family farm and I've been full-time on the farm since, uh, January of 2016. And we had started this a few years prior to that. And so partially speaking for my uncle, but basically I think the big thing was um, just wanting to, again, again, improve, improve um, water quality in Wisconsin. Cause I know it's, it's been an issue for quite a while. And I, I can't, 
I guess maybe you guys would know better than me of when we kind of started to, to um, talk about this, like water, water in Wisconsin, if it's been maybe going on now for a decade or so. And so I think that was kind of a big part of why Tom really wanted to dig into it and say, Hey, what, what, what can we do as a farm to, to help this? So. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations. You've done a lot. Thank you. David, that was great. I, I just wanted to I'll build on something you said when you talked about the companies who uh, buy the products for manufacture or distribution to the public. It reminded me of something I read about General Mills just a few weeks ago. And uh, they have um, on their corporate website, they've indicated that their key suppliers uh, must now be sus use sustainable farming practices in order to do business with them. And that's exactly the point you raised is that when the demand comes from those who buy the eventual end product, uh, I think that's when we see improvement. So there's another example. Yeah. So uh, great story. And um, you're one heck of a storyteller, David. Uh, it's um, really, this was so interesting. I, I just, um, you know, it's like we could talk for hours about this. I think there are so many questions. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll hear from you again. Oh, and, we're gonna. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll drag you back into this. Um, I wanted to ask a question of you, David. I wondered, um, so much of the material you talked about is, um, it, it's it's new to us, uh, some as a refresher. Uh, it would be so great to have an outline of what you talked about. And I wondered if you might have something like that you could share with us, some information that relates to that which you talked about today. Well, I mean, I'd be, I'd be fine sharing my slide deck if that's kind of what you're thinking. Sure, that'd be that'd be great if you yeah. do that, and mm -hmm. uh, it might bring up more questions than it answers. But uh, that's the beauty of all of this is, uh, you know, how much we've learned from people like you. So thank you. Did you put that slide show on a P as a PDF on your website. Yeah, um, are you asking me or David? Yeah, yeah I'm asking 14 Mile if they, uh, obviously if David approves. Yes, no, that'd be fine. Yep, that I, that'd be fine if you wanted to do that. Yeah. I can, uh, I can uh, send it to you, Don, um, okay. in an email after this, because I'll, um, sh as, as once you're you're done with me, I'll sign off and continue on with my day. So, okay, I'm sure you've got a lot of work to do, and you're welcome to uh, uh, stay with us if you want to. And uh, but uh, I know there's 2,800 cows out there looking for your attention as well, right? So. Uh, actually, not only that, but this this little girl here, she's got to get chipped today. Oh, so. oh. This is <laughs> all the, right, this is hey, the sweetheart. office dog. So yeah, great. So okay. Thanks yep. again, David. This was great. This is uh just a tremendous discussion. Really appreciate it. Good. I'm glad that you guys liked it. And I I I'm glad to be able to kind of get the word out there and hopefully we spread the word and other farms uh continue to look into it and do it on their own farm. So thank you, sure. David. Great. Thanks. Appreciate it. Sounds good. Thanks, Don. Again, I'll email that to you right away. So okay, thanks. Oh, let's see. The next thing on the agenda, and I won't take too much time with this because uh, there's some other stuff more important, but uh, just the, the new organization, and we've talked uh, about this a few times. I just want to give you a status. Uh, uh, the the Fortune Mile Alliance, uh, we've had discussions with Tri Lakes about it, with the town about it. Um, and um, so we filed all of the paperwork and what we wait for now is the final notification on the 501c3 and the nonprofit status. And that's the thing that typically takes the most time, it takes about eight, uh, six weeks and we're right at about that time period now. And um, so, uh, you know, we've got one foot in and one foot out. We're still functioning as our joint watershed committee. Uh, we're functioning also trying to develop our alliance and uh, open ourselves up to uh, stakeholders throughout the watershed and be more inclusive. And so we're making some progress. We're um, uh, trying to uh, figure out the process. How do we continue working with the town and with Tri Lakes? And uh, there are some things uh, that we continue to do uh, are some of our water testing things, the promotional activities once we're able to get out there at 
farmers markets and different events where uh, some of the costs incurred for that will um, expect reimbursement from uh, Trilake. So we're we're working through that progress or process now to uh, determine how we do that and uh, how we assure Trilakes that these things are in fact valid expenses that relate to the nine kilowatt plan. So those things are coming together slowly. Um, some of these things we didn't envision when we first came out with the idea about creating this 501c3. But uh, generally, I think we're, um, we're moving along pretty well. Um, you know, our soft launch is really this Friday. Uh, our intent with that uh, March 12th local event is to really tell the world about us and uh, hopefully uh, um, have people see us as an open organization, not just a lakes oriented organization, but watershed wide. So. Um, Anyway, I think things are moving well, and uh, that's about what I have to report. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Okay, if you do, raise your hand, otherwise we'll move on. Okay, so um, my key element plan status, um, I, uh, I don't have anything specific on that from Kaysen. Um, I did have a conversation with him about a week ago about things in general, and um, uh, he's been involved. Uh, we're not the only watershed, uh, evidently, in his life. And uh, he's working with a lot of people in Adams County. He's been a pretty busy guy, but uh, you know, certainly um, uh, he is poised to uh, uh, take action here. And I'm sure he's thinking in terms of job descriptions and the other things that um, lend themselves to um, uh, managing this uh, Nike Hillman plan. Um, so uh, nothing, not very much new to report there in terms of the video or the flyer. And uh, really uh, that will become a little bit more important, I think, as uh, people start coming back to our lake places here. So I'm gonna move to item number nine, which is the YouTube channel. And I think I heard that there is some movement on that. So uh, Karen and Rachel, anything to report? Um. I'm not sure what you mean by movement on it. I mean, uh, some activity. I haven't seen a lot. Maybe. Oh, okay. I misunderstood. Yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing a lot. That's why I'm excited about doing the Friday thing because I'm going to promote it. Uh -huh. And then I'm going to promote it more and more on Facebook. So we definitely need to get more people on subscribing to it. And I would encourage all of you to subscribe to that channel. Even if you don't look at it, just go on youtube.com, put in 14 mile watershed alliance, and then su subscribe to it. It's really important that we get our numbers up. So, okay, good. Do me a favor, Karen, just send us all an email. I mean, you've got the distribution oh, okay. list I send out, just send sure. it. And I will do it for sure if somebody reminds me to do it. So, <laughs> thanks. Um, future video, videos and Zoom sessions. Uh, we had talked about this a couple of times and um, when we all partnered with Rachel and um, uh, the Kiss the Ground, uh, that was really a cool activity. And um, I think we all agree we wanna do more of that. And um, so uh, to, to co-sponsor with other groups, um, productions like that, um, also, it reminded me of a video someone sent to me a few weeks ago that was so well done. Uh, it was about a water group. I wish I could remember the details. I would tell you the name of it. But um, it just, um, it made me want to, at some point, do a video like that about us. Uh, I thought those two videos we did were really nice. Uh, our uh, first and second videos that we did, I guess that was last fall. And uh, I'd like to up the game a little bit and um, you know, somebody help direct us or whatever, but put out a really strong promotion on uh, what the Alliance is all about. So uh, a future task. I, um, I, yeah, I, go ahead. Um, yeah, please. Um, I contacted that Biggest Little Farm um, mm -hmm. group and asked if we could screen their um, video. Uh -huh. And they said we could, but then they also told me that it was going to be like $300 to do it. Oh. So okay. um, we can do them as, you know, a showing once for some, you know, for all of us, mm -hmm. but it would cost us some money. Okay. Well, um, that is good to know that it might be worth 300 bucks to do it. And who knows once, when we officially have our, our status, I think we can go out and ask key people to say, 
hey, would you donate 300 bucks to show this? You know, we'll mention your name or whatever, something on, on that order, right? Yeah. So, okay. That's a great idea, Karen. Thanks. Did, sure. did anybody happen to see it? No, I did not. <laughs> I really encourage all of you guys to see it because it's really about what we're talking about. Okay. It's exactly what David Trimner was talking about. It, it really, it covers everything. And I don't know if Scott's still on, but I would highly encourage him to see it as well. Rachel, did you see it? I have not yet. No, it's been on my list, but things have been getting in the way. But yeah, I, I do. I need to sit down and watch it. I heard it reference Apricot Lane Farms, right? Apricot Lane Farms. It, it was oh. referenced in something else I was watching another day. Um, yeah. So it's definitely, it's well known. Yeah, it is. It's really about exactly what David was talking about. It's about soil health. They took this farm that was pretty much like the Dust Bowl. <laughs> it was bad, bad soil. And they turned it into this incredible, lush Garden of Eden that is unbelievable. And I would highly recommend, I know I keep pushing it on you guys and I'm sorry I'm doing that. I was just so blown away by this video that it just got me so excited. So um, when you have a go ahead. I was just going to say, remind us again, was that on Netflix? Is that where you found that or? It was, well, where I saw it was, um, I think it was Hulu and it oh, was Hulu. free. Okay. So I was able to, I have Hulu, so it was free for me. So, mm -hmm. but you can go on any of the different, um, you know, streaming platforms and you yeah. can buy it. And I think it was maybe $4 or it could oh, be okay. more, but it's well worth it. You know, I think it's worth the extra money to do it but I was able to do it free. So if you want, I mean, we could even, if it's still free, I'd have to check it out, but we could do it as a group where we go yeah. through my screen and I share my screen and then you guys can see it. Yeah. We could probably do that. Yeah. So, you know, a nice so night activity yeah. after Friday. Yeah. We all free yeah, up. Friday. We've got all this time after Friday. So. <laughs> after Friday for sure. <laughs> yeah. Good. That's a great idea, Karen. I do want to see that. So um, I like your idea about maybe some night we all just, whoever is available, just get together to watch that. So um, item 11, status of grants. I just, I think you all have seen the email. I mean, it is, I think it's really tremendous. Um, the, um, the grant situation, uh, every grant that we were a part of requesting was approved. Um, and as Scott said, and Bill Pegler is, is, I think he's still on the call with us, and um, Adams County got attention. It got a lot more attention because other lake groups, I noticed as I went through the lake, uh, the, uh, the list, other lake groups in the county also got attention, and um, I'm happy for that. But I am really blown away by um, the, the grants, uh, the activity that this group of people put in, not that we owned each one of these grants, but we all had a hand in requesting these three grants that I mentioned that um, they amount to just about a quarter million dollars in grants over the next few years, which are pretty tremendous. And it's the Healthy Lakes grants, um, which is, you know, it's, it's pretty much all Dave Trudeau. Uh, and there were 30 of them this year. I think it amounted to like $23,000, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong. But in total, um, in the past three years, uh, our committee, and primarily with, with Dave's help, has been responsible for over 50 projects that are like Healthy Lakes projects, which is pretty cool. Um, the other thing, the, uh, the water testing uh, grants, and um, it, it covers, with the agreement that we had with the DNR, it, it covers our water, te water testing costs uh, really from January this year through June, and then the grant takes over on July 1st and covers water testing costs uh, through the end of December in 2023. And that's worth a lot of money. And then the, um, the grant for the resource that was so important. And yet, um, I guess, you know, from what I heard from some people is that uh, it was a long shot. And that was to fund that seasoned resource to implement the nine kilowatt plant. Uh, over the next three years, and that was successfully approved. And that was a lot of Kaysen's work, but we helped out. And our 
you know, our friends at Tri Lakes uh, kicked in a, uh, a co-fund for that. But uh, those three grants, I think, are just amazing. Um, <laughs> they just do so much to move this thing forward. So I don't know. Anybody else got anything to say about that? I mean, uh, many of you, uh, there are so many hours. I conservatively estimated it was about 275 hours. I'm sure if we got down to uh, detailing all of it, we would find a lot more hours in that. But, you know, y'all need to pat yourselves on the back for uh, a job well done. I think that was great. It it speaks to the amount of work that was done on the grant specifically, but also I think it's about our reputation that this committee has, um, has established uh, in the community and we're respected for the work that we did. And I think uh, that's one of the reasons why the grants were successful is that um, as a citizen group, I think we're doing well. So anyway, good for y'all. Um, I, I have a question for Scott. Um, in the past, when they've released uh, the grant awards, they've usually had uh, the numerical score that it was each grant was giving and given, and it's uh, kind of from high to low, so you can kind of see where your where you, where your ranking is. Um, I didn't see that this time. Do you know whether there's any uh, rhyme or reason to the to how the list is put out as far as uh, any numerical score ranking? Uh, short answer is no. Um, I don't know why they do what they do sometimes. Uh, you know, it's, I can tell you that uh, uh, the healthy, the healthy lakes projects, all your projects obviously scored well enough to get funded. Uh, there were probably in, you know, in the 60 to 70, well, probably culture 70 percentile range. Um, when you look at where they fell on the, you know, if one or zero was the last grant that got funded and hundred percent was the top grant, you guys are right around, you know, 60, 70%, just above the middle of the pack, but they were good projects and there was a ton of projects this year. So you guys did good. I, I know on the healthy lakes, that was the largest award of any in the state. So that was, that was uh, good news. Yeah, there was, uh, well, also was Adams County. Well, Adams County one, I think that was the third largest one. It was like 200K or something like that for not quite 200,000. So and it's just, it's blown away. I just finished, we got so many freaking grants this year. I just actually finished the last scope here uh, earlier this morning. So. You guys should be getting your letters and if your emails already with the announcements and the grant scopes and everything from Gina soon. That means the money's going to roll pretty soon. Good. Good. Well, good job, everybody. Appreciate it. Appreciate the help from all of our, all of our advisors. Um, you know, it's, I think it's helped to make a difference. So. Thank you for all of that. Um, next item, item 12, um, our, I guess we call it our denitrification project. Uh, it's on Owens Rock. And I think you all know the background about how this started, just got started on a tour uh, with our friends from Little Plover and uh, from Wisconsin Wetlands and WPBGA and of course, Provost was there and uh, he and a couple of other people got involved uh, in a discussion that's led to what looks like could be a pretty cool project. So, um, Scott, you want to give us, sure. tell us what you know about this. Yeah, this is exactly, this is a, you know, this is a result of us, of that tour we did out there where you guys set up, what had all the partners and uh, we got, everybody just got, you know, this is why you do those things is you get jamming on something, you come up with an idea and you start talking with folks and, you know, you, you get things going. So uh, wildlife was with us at the time and they were talking about what they want to do on this 900 acre parcel. We said, well, just a second, if you're going to do that, let's, you know, let's tag team on this and let's see where we can get some synergies. So uh, the idea of this project is uh, it's all funded by DNR. This is the DNR project. We're going out there. Uh, I submitted it for like 10 K 10,000 bucks to do this. And when I got done, it's like defending your thesis, you know, you had to go out in front of the committee and actually one of the reviewers wanted to know if he wanted more money. And as, cause it was, 
there's a lot of interest in this project because it's got a groundwater surface water component and with the nitrogen being a hot issue right now and of course my answer is always yes if somebody says you want more money so we'll see what we can expand it a little more um so you know can it go to the next slide or can i do that no you're sharing you got it all right so if you don't if you folks don't know this is it uh owens rock is over is up by the it says high nox that's nitrite nitrate yep it's right if you go right to that uh between the two yellow dots it's right there in the top that's owens rock yep that whole area is all under is a uh, leo prairie chicken land and it's pastured to uh they rent it out for uh, beefers and whatnot to pasture it to uh, keep the weeds down and to keep uh, the right habitat for prairie chickens without using a ton of herbicides because there's just too much out there to treat chemically. So they graze it and then they do different grazing densities. Um, they do different things to uh, you know, stimulate or not stimulate, but simulate like what it would have been if a buffalo came in an area. You know, it, it's just pretty nuts. It's really cool stuff. Well, it, in order to do that, they want uh, the property manager wanted to plug those two dark lines. Those are lateral ditches, and those are owned by the state. Those were put in years ago by a farmer that it, it ultimately failed. But those drainage ditches drain to the south to that major. Uh, tributary to tri lakes and what the idea is now when they she wants to fill them create more habitat out there and then that way the cattle got a place across what well, that's ultimately going to do hydraulically is going to raise that water table so if we go to that next slide please it's going to raise that water table in this dark organic area uh those are histosols they're called type of soil but that dark organic area has a ton of carbon in it Tons of, literally, tons of carbon. So when the water, when that nitrogen rich water comes up to the, comes up to the surface now and floods out, when the water temperatures get above 40 degrees, that's going to go anaerobic. And when it does that, certain bacteria are going to start messing with the nitrogen and uh, it's going to end up, it's going to go through a denitrification process. Um, and when it does that, that nitrogen is going to go back up in the air instead of the water. So the idea is to raise this water table and try to uh, scavenge the top one to two, three feet of, of nitrogen off that water. And that's usually the water at the top of the water table is usually what feeds your lakes. Everything else kind of goes underneath it. So if we could, if this is an effective tool, then you know, there's a potential to uh, you know, do this elsewhere in some other lands where like uh, David was talking, it just doesn't pay to farm. You know, you, they got the farmers right across the road now there. If you, can you go back to that previous slide there, Rachel? Yeah, so we see at a high Knox area, uh, just to the east of that, that's all muck farming. And that was all tiled this year and last year, or last year. So they're not giving up on it, but it's good. They're gonna have a tough time making the nitrate standards in the future. So this may be a possible option for them to do. They may have to put some of those fields into this type of uh, environment to balance out their portfolio of nitrogen use. This is how that program is going to work. So let's check it out. So we're going to put those monitoring wells upslope, which is up here along the highway in W. And then we're going to put some on the downslope side. And as groundwater is flowing that direction, we're going to sample it for total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and some other things. We're going to find out if raising that water table did effectively remove nitrogen. And if it does, great. If it doesn't, okay, we're not done yet, but we'll try it. All right. Um, but if it does work, we're going to definitely use that in our arsenal and some of these marginal lands that will help improve water quality because of that 9 element plan nitrogen component. So this also serves uh, part of your implementation of the 9 key element plan. If you go to the next slide and uh, the one after. So this is where this is how this whole thing works, right? Uh, and Rachel was ex uh, explaining this to Scott on it before. It was like, way to go. Just nailed it. But basically, the you got nitrogen that's out here. It's applied as ammonium nitrate most of the time. Because uh, only the, the plants can only use the 
inorganic forms. It has to be ammonia form or nitrate form for the plants to use it. It can't be uh, bound up with uh, a, a chunk of organic matter or something like that, like a protein. Well, so what happens is decompose. There's, there's bacteria, there's certain fungi, there's certain other processes we don't even understand yet where it converts that ammonia or that nitrogen in organic form. It breaks it down and it converts it. It goes through this process called nitrogen fixing. And then um, some of that ammonia can be used by plants. So some of it doesn't, but eventually it gets converted. It goes through nitrification, gets converted to nitrites, nitrate, when there's oxygen added. And then when it goes up, when it goes up into organics, that nitrogen will be, the oxygen will be scavenged off by other bacteria, leaving only the nitrogen left that goes up to the atmosphere. That's what we're trying to do is we're in that blue circle. We're gonna use the organic soils that has that carbon, the carbon's needed in this equation for as a source of fuel as well for bacteria. So this will help. Um, Okay, and I think there's, is there one last slide? Yeah, so this is a schematic of what we're doing here. Over on the left, you'll see that's the current water table. It's below that blue or that black, or that's the organic soils. We're gonna raise that so it skims right below the surface there. And then uh, we're gonna plug those ditches and hopefully get the nitrogen, instead of passing through and going to tri lakes, it's gonna go up in the atmosphere. That's our goal. So. Uh, I don't know, it hasn't been tried to this scale before on purpose, but we're gonna give it a shot and see what happens. So there, that's your project. Wow. So hey, Scott? Yeah. Is there um, percent carbon or percent organic component that you're looking for or that these soils have? And then is there also like a, a time element that it has to be, uh, yeah, good question. Yeah, you want uh, the carbon typically in soils, it, it ranges two and a half to three percent carbon in organic. That's like, but around here, if it's a sand country out here, the topsoil, if it was high and dry, the topsoil's gone. You know, it's gone. It, the, the wind has eroded it away because of the farming practice in the past. So the only thing left are these organic soils out here that were used to be old marsh or actually swamps until they were drained. Uh, and some of those, that carbon content can be as high as you know, up to 18% in those heavy organic soils. Some of those organic soils, that top layer might only be two feet thick, but at one time was probably six feet thick, four to six feet thick. And all that carbon went up in the atmosphere. So we want to put it back into the ground. You know, that's what we, that's another reason to do soil health practice is you lock that carbon back up in the ground instead of putting it up in the atmosphere. But um, anyway, so it's got the perfect conditions. We just need to try it and do an empirical study on it. Scott? Yes. Did, did you do baseline um, numbers? I, obviously you had to, to see. Oh, well, no, we haven't, we haven't started the project yet, but yes, we have to do that. Yeah. Yep, we haven't done it yet, but yes, you're correct. We have to have a baseline, right? You need to, that will be the pre, and then we're gonna plug the ditches and then we'll do more monitoring. That's our post monitoring. And hopefully if we do it right, well, we will do it right. Uh, we, we should be able to actually find out how many pounds of nitrogen were lost, you know, mass that right out. And that'll be, that's what I'm getting all googly about is because I can't wait to get in there with those numbers and start seeing what we're doing. So Scott, uh, will, will this be something that'll happen soon or does it take a long time to, well, to um, for the results? Okay, so we'll start uh, I don't know, probably in April when the ground thaws out. We're gonna do the well installation out there. Um, we're gonna start right away and then probably in a year or two. Okay. You know, I'd like to do, I got it set up for a year of monitoring because you know, you, can't, you gotta have enough data to make sure it's statistically valid. So we want to, the more data I got, the, the more defendable or the more I can tell how accurate it is. So um, probably, you know, a, a year and a half from now, we'll have a final report on it. Okay, great, thank you. So Scott, uh, this uh, project is uh, something that uh, would be totally fitting for a presentation at our State of the Lakes conference. Um, the people uh, in, in the town, in our, in our area, 
really don't have any idea uh, what kind of uh, science goes on behind the scenes here. And uh, the graphics that you had there are very explicit and they're reasonably easy to understand. We've been uh, bumped by a number of people in regard to the practices and what we're doing and what we're getting done. Um, this is a really good example of what's going on and the synergies that we have with other groups in the state and uh, private sectors here. So please consider uh, joining us uh, for our State of the Lakes. We're gonna be doing that uh, uh, in the early part of August. Um, so- uh, Yeah, that, that no problem if, you know, hopefully we do it in person, you know, instead of, you know, the COVID yeah, will be relaxed right. enough. Hopefully we do it in person. Uh, you know, the, the last year annual meeting down there for Tri Lakes was a disaster trying to get in. And, you know, I was on the phone, but, um, we couldn't i couldn't be there according to our supervisors so those are the kind of talks you really need to do in person and uh somebody uh, me or somebody will definitely be there it's august 7th just so you know yeah, as long as that doesn't conflict with the whiskey myers concert in wisconsin dells <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, we all have our priorities. Yeah, yeah. So Scott, thank you for putting this together. Um, you know, we've talked about it so generally, and, um, you know, it brings a couple things to mind. Uh, one is, um, because this came up at the, the Tri Lakes meeting last week, Wednesday, and I know you were a part of it, but had some technical difficulties. Um, I would like to suggest that uh, we put this on the Tri Lakes agenda because they need to understand uh, that this is another tool we're looking for. Uh, for um, and there's there's a couple things about this that I think are really cool. One is uh, certainly it's not the um, uh, the end all be all. Uh, answer to our issues, but it's one of the things that will help uh, to minimize the uh, mm -hmm. uh, nitrogen. The other thing interesting about this is when you think about asking our neighbors upstream uh, to make adjustments in what they do today, just as we're asking people who live around the lakes, uh, this is one of those things that doesn't cost anything. Uh, if this works, it means that uh, they might do some reditching, but you're not asking them to take any special precautions other or uh, special means other than uh, to perhaps change the flow of a ditch. And so it, it is probably the most natural process we have seen so far that has some promise. Would you agree? Yeah, uh, my nature knows way more than we do. We got lots to learn from her. Yeah, for sure. Well, that was great. Thank you, Scott, for putting that together. It really, it helped uh, to really increase our understanding. Appreciate it. It was just a shorty, but, uh, you know, there's more to it, way, much more to it, but um, I do got to get going. So, okay, good. Thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys all. This is a great meeting and super excited about uh, Dave Trimner. That, yeah, that's it was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, Rachel, you're right on, you know, she's a, she's a Whiskey Myers fan too, I see. <laughs> Oh, geez. You would like him, oh, Don. I must have missed him somewhere, but you and I are in, I think we're in different generations. So uh, maybe well, that I explains hope, it. I, I hope so. I'm still working. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, let me ask you this. Did you ever know of a group called El Ray and the Night Beats? No, Dwight, were you in Oh, uh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. That just proves the difference in our ages. <laughs> All right, sir. Go All back right, to you your, guys have uh, a good one. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. So I'll get us through this agenda. It's been kind of a, a long afternoon for us, but really great. I mean, Scott's right. This has been a great meeting. So item 13. Um, John, anything new about upstream water testing? Yeah, I've got a couple of things, Don. Uh, the first is that uh, we had some very strange conditions uh, uh, in our last test. We tested the second last day of February, and we saw ice dams located in three locations in the ditching system. Uh, this is at a time when there is low water. We've, got, we've had the lowest flow that I've seen in the 40 months that I've done my testing. Oh. Uh, that's just something to, to, to note. Uh, I, I don't have any cause, causation uh, other than 
maybe somebody's holding water, but uh, one of those locations was out of the area where water is held. So that doesn't, uh, it, 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 bears, it bears note. Uh, the other thing that I have, uh, it was for Scott in particular, but for the group, um, we're uh, approaching the time when uh, our test uh, um, regime related to uh, our transducers uh, should be up and that we should be able to put them into motion. We put in five transducers in locations uh, um, in the nine places that I test. Unfortunately, two of those transducers are plugged solid. We have such a high uh, rate of um, debris flowing in some of these ditches that they're not gonna work. And I'm afraid that the flows in the other locations are probably so variable that uh, we're not necessarily gonna get the kind of uh, um, parameters that we need to be able to specifically uh, talk to our flows as relates to what we've done in the past. Uh, now, having said that, there's a reason for why I brought this up. Uh, we're uh, in the need, in my opinion, uh, of generating a couple more volunteers for water sampling. Uh, it's not that I'm gonna go anywhere anytime soon, but it, uh, I'm gonna uh, <laughs> celebrate my 72nd birthday here very shortly. There are a couple of uh, us that are uh, even older than I am. Uh, and uh, having said that, uh, we need to plan for the future. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I have a desire to go and, and uh, work within the Water Action Volunteers Program, which calls for habitat assessments and biotic indexes be taken at least twice a year. Uh, now, they're very time consuming. You don't do them at all nine locations, uh, but uh, the, uh, both of these uh, things can be done by uh, the general public, if you will. Uh, there's not a tremendous amount of science to them. It's a matter of picking bugs out of the out of the stream bank and identifying them, counting them, and uh, that gives us a a uh, a much better understanding of the quality of our water. Uh, a sow bug, for instance, is not necessarily the greatest thing uh, as relates to clean water. It'll live in sewer water. Um, the 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 whole thing then deals with. Um, well, just as I said, uh, just getting a, a a take on where our water is. Um, so uh, somehow we need to get a couple more volunteers. Uh, I really, really want to get these uh, uh, missing elements in our uh, regime done. So sorry I took so long, but that's what's up for us. Hey, John, a, a quick question. I remember you and I met with uh, students at UWSP to tell them about our program. And at the time, there was some interest from a couple of them in the water science program about uh, potentially working on some projects, uh, maybe doing uh, this uh, uh, bug index that were uh, that you had just mentioned. Um, is that worth following up on? Well, um, I got back to the leader of their group, and uh, he indicated that there was no interest on the part of any of their individuals in, oh, okay. in regard right. to engaging. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to mention about this thing, I was missing it, I was stuttering because I was trying to bring it to my mind. Uh, everything to do with uh, neonicotinoids, you and I have had a little bit of a conversation about that, Don, and for the rest of the group, neonics are a group of pesticides that are used, uh, and I, I can guarantee you through a conversation with Scott that uh, they're in high residence in our waters. Uh, hey, John? Yeah. John, just you know, Scott is our guest speaker next month talking about neonics. All right. Well, then we'll let him talk to it. But uh, there's a good reason for why I want to do these bug counts. Yeah. OK. Well, um, we can talk you know, rather than taking a lot of time in this meeting. There's a couple of things I want to talk about is, uh, you know, uh, how do we reach volunteers uh, through our outreach websites and all of that? So we can do that in the background. But um, I hear you, John, and I agree uh, there should be people out there helping you doing the tests. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, anything on in-water lake testing, Phil? Uh, just a couple of things real quick. 
Um, later this month, I'll be contacting the State Lab of Hygiene in Madison to set up the phosphorus and nitrogen testing that we do in, uh, in addition to the CLMN testing, the normal uh, lake testing. And uh, also sometime this month, uh, I'll be contacting the Wood County Health Department to arrange uh, supplies and billing for the E. coli testing that we'll be doing again this summer on Lake Sherwood. So be some things to, uh, to get set up. Uh, and I'm assuming, although I don't know this for sure, I'm assuming that the CLMN testing will start in May this year as opposed to uh, June like it did last year. Hopefully um, COVID is in a state where we can uh, get started in May. Um, Anna got in touch with me and she wanted to let you know that all the equipment has come in now for the clean waters or clean, clean lakes monitoring. Oh, great. I'll have to get that from her and get it organized for the volunteers uh, beginning in May, as I, as I hope. <laughs> That's all I have done. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Um, Dave, anything more about uh, Healthy Lakes? Um, yes, just briefly, uh, a, a minor correction. We had 25 uh, projects in the in the grant that was just approved, not 30. So, okay. and so that's where we come up with our 23,600 and something. Um, I wanted to uh, just give a quick shout out to everybody uh, in the group here who helped uh, with the Lake Sherwood Fish Sticks project, project that we finished on the 26th of February. Uh, John, Karen, Phil, Don, Barb all came out and got their hands dirty and Jerry helped us big time by providing a UTV for us to use the last couple of days when we had the generator out on the ice. So thank you to everybody. It was kind of, we had the sub-zero got thick ice and then it was uh, like go like crazy to make sure we got it done and we and we just uh, kind of just, just barely, barely finished when our window of opportunity was 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 perfect so thanks to everybody uh for helping with that 70 trees out there for fish habitat now so that was a good job for for all and i also wanted um, me to mention that she really enjoyed working on that project and to seeing how it came out it, it, it's it's some physical labor but it but it's also pretty rewarding too so i appreciate the help it was fun, Dave, and I, um, I think uh, you did a wonderful job of organizing it, and uh, you deserve a lot of credit for uh, all the work that you've done with uh, those projects. Anything more, Dave? Uh, no, can move on. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, Karen, outreach and promotion. Um, just so you know, there should be, and I haven't gone by it because I stay in my house like a good person, but evidently the marquee did have the, um, the new information about Water Week. Has anybody gone by it? Well, anyways, it's there. I was also informed, although I haven't seen it yet because I've, I've been on Channel 300. It's supposed to be on Channel 300. Um, Barb, as you know, um, was involved in getting all those uh, flyers put into the grocery bags at Pritzel's. So I don't know how that's going, Barb, but hopefully yeah. that's going well. There was a total of 400 that I left there. So okay. I'm not sure if they're still working on it, but you know, it'll get out to a lot of people. Great. So, and then um, again, if any of you guys have any kind of, um, you know, Facebook postings that you want or website postings that you want or any information, please send them my way. And I'll be happy to post them on, you know, either uh, Facebook or, you know, I can help with sending them out to Phil. The other thing is we need um, more people to get involved with um, doing some of the, um, the, uh, the website, you know, helping with website, what we're going to do there. So please make sure that you give all of your ideas to Phil, me or Barb, and we'll get those into it. Um, obviously, that's supposed to be where people go to get most of their information. So that's really important as well. Um, and I guess that's about it. I mean, we're just really pushing for Water Week. Yep. Thank you, Karen. Thanks for all the, for all the hard work you've done with that. Thanks much. Um, I would just add, um, I think 
uh, our our uh, local event is being promoted in all three newspapers. I know Bill Pegler was with us. I don't know if he still is, but uh, Bill helped us to get mentioned in the Adams Friend Friendship newspaper. Um, we sent something to the Tribune. I don't get the Tribune. I don't know if it showed up. If somebody sees it, let me know. And then in the um, Wisconsin Rapids, do they call it the Times, that weekly free newspaper? We should be in there um, this week. So uh, any lake reports? Town, county, or tri-lakes updates? I can give you a little information on the town. We think the only thing we got going that pertains to the water is uh, we passed a resolution to um, support the organization, organization, organizing of township of Adams towns to work cooperatively with state officials in the water accumulation or water flooding issues that we've had in the county in the last few years. So that's the start of trying to get some organized and get some help from the state. Um, so hopefully we got a group of town, uh, towns that are uh, experiencing that. We'll get some recognition where going individually, they put us on the back burner. And I guess uh, from the county, the only thing I can say is I've been watching the uh, land and water meetings and their information. I was, I guess, somewhat disappointed but maybe I shouldn't be, but I see uh, Anna James and her projects for the year and her goals was to complete uh, development of a watershed led, produ the producer led watershed for the uh, Roche Cree group or Roche Cree watershed. Uh, nothing about 14 miles. We've been asking for some help with that for three years. So. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. I was hoping to ask Hasten about it, but um, he's been busy. He does not respond to emails right now. That's all I got. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. I had heard about the uh, Rocha Cree producer uh, led group, and um, uh, it might have been Anna who told me about it. And that got started um, back when uh, uh, Richard Matsky. Uh, still lived up on Rosha Cree and he moved uh, two or three months ago. And I think what happened is because he had started that, he actually got a couple of farmers uh, interested in it. And so they had a little bit of traction with that. And I think with his leaving, uh, Adams County perhaps took it over to make sure that that thing mm -hmm. uh, uh, remained viable. So maybe that's why it was on her uh, uh, list at Land and Water. So. Don, I can speak to that yeah. a little bit as well. Oh, thanks. Um, I've been accompanying, they've held a couple of meetings, uh, Adams County that has hosted them with a few of the farmers in the Big Rocha Cree, uh, and I've been sitting in on those. And uh, I think it really, it comes down to just, you know, the farmers that had expressed interest in recent past um, had kind of started to join this conversation and wanted to make something happen. And um, it just so happened that they happened to be in that watershed. So it's, I don't think it's, a matter of you know this watershed or that watershed it's it's more of trying to get a, a group together in the in the sands yeah thanks for that and not to say that oh go no, ahead i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt i just wanted to get in before uh, we got closed out i was just going to add uh you know it, what's important is that you know there's farmers in the area that are, are moving and shaking with these with some of the ideas that david had shared today and that stuff is contagious and um, you know once these farmers get to the point where they're comfortable reaching out to their neighbors um, you know that stuff spreads like wildfire so it seems to me that a heads up in regard to this uh, would be a little note to uh, the pwvga uh, in regard to what's going on in the southern end of the county uh, uh, Damas and group uh, would be kind of tickled to hear that uh, some of the big people uh, in the farming industry down in the southern end of the county are doing this. Um, just a thought. Um, in um, 
I think the last conversation I had with Tamas was probably two weeks ago and just following up on that uh, get together that had been brought up before the holidays. And um, Tamas had shared with us that uh, just before we had that chat with him, uh, he had gotten a call from Tom Lochner, who you might recall as the executive director of the Wisconsin Cranberry Producers. And in that call, Tom Lochner had mentioned there were two uh, cranberry uh, farmers who were interested uh, in a uh, producer-led water council. And uh, I'm not sure there's been more discussion. I brought it up to uh, Tamas when I talked to him a couple of weeks ago, and he said uh, there had been no further movement. But I've tried to keep uh, Tom Lochner and Tamas uh, both involved in uh, like the local event that we're holding and uh, invited them to this meeting as well. Uh, and uh, just so they know that we have a strong interest in learning more about our agriculture neighbors and working with them. So we'll just have to keep working it. Anything more? Uh, Jerry, thank you for sharing what's going on with the county and the town. Okay, um, so uh, with nothing more than let's talk about the next agenda. Um, I had asked Scott uh, a week or so ago if, um, and I'm not sure how we got on the topic, but I asked if he'd be willing to speak with us about uh, neonicotinoids. And uh, he said, yeah, he'd be happy to do that. So he's gonna put a presentation together for our next meeting, which um, I had told him if we follow our normal schedule, it will be on April 12th, which would be the second Monday uh, of April. So is everybody good with that date? Okay. Uh, is everybody good with uh, Scott being our guest speaker for that date? Yeah? Okay. I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, so um, any other items for the agenda? Uh, you could mention them right now or feel free to email me. Uh, typically, you know, about two weeks from now, I'll be putting together the agenda from my notes here. And uh, so if you got something to add, just let me know. I'd be happy to add it. Okay. All right. Anything more? Anybody want to move for adjournment? So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. A long meeting, but really a good one. I um, really enjoyed what I heard today. Learned a lot from it. So good stuff. Have a good afternoon. Enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. And thanks for being a part of this. Thank you. Bye. See you.